What's up, guys, and welcome daily theologians. I'm about to get in big trouble with this video because I want to explain why the atonement is limited to the elect. Or did Jesus die for the whole world and just fail to accomplish saving so many people? And what does the movie Free Willy have to do with today's video and the preaching of Steve Lawson, which is incredible. You're going to want to stick around for this video, if only to see how all these things come together perfectly. Stick around and check this out. So the question of who Christ died for is one that a lot of people waste a lot of ink over because they fail to submit to what the Bible clearly teaches. They ignore the doctrine of election. They create a doctrine of foreknowledge. It doesn't exist. And well, in the end, they end up looking foolish because they don't believe the word of God. They kind of look like the CGI from a very popular movie. See if you can spot the connection to the desire for free will and the chanting and that just one time, you can do it just one time. Come on, Willie, you have to do it once, just once, boy. Randolph, you ever see him jump that high? Things can happen. So just like the impossibility of that being real, that is the same problem with free will. And it must be the central focus of the limited atonement because people go from one to the other and they say, well, humanity is free and real choices and whatnot. Uh, none of that is biblical and none of that means your choices aren't real. Uh, they're just not independent. And so I want to cover three reasons specifically, actually probably more than that, why the atonement is actually accomplishing what Jesus paid to redeem for the people he paid to redeem. And it's actually accomplishing the purposes and plans of God. And then why this is a huge problem if you hold to a universal atonement, because you're basically making humanity's will capable of the same power Jesus had in the resurrection from the dead. So stay with this, but check out this amazing clip of Steve Lawson bringing the absolute thunder for about five minutes here. And the question that must be raised is what did Jesus accomplish in his death upon the cross? Did Jesus die for all? Did he merely make salvation possible? Or did he actually save? Did Jesus merely make redemption possible? Or did he actually accomplish redemption upon the cross? That is the question. Did Jesus merely make propitiation of the Father possible, or did he actually satisfy and placate the righteous anger of God toward his elect. This is the question. Did Jesus die for those who were already in hell? And if so, for what reason? Did Jesus die for those who will perish? Or did he only die for those who will believe upon him and who will find themselves in heaven. The focus of this session is upon for whom did Christ die? 
And I am deeply persuaded that the clear teaching of Scripture is that Jesus Christ died for the sins of those who were entrusted to Him by the Father in eternity past, that God the Father chose His elect, and He gave them to the Son, and there were stipulations as He gave them to the Son, that He must be willing to come into this world and to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless and perfect life, but that he must go to Calvary's cross, and there he must be lifted up to die, and there upon the cross, all of the sins of all of those whom the Father had given to the Son before time began were laid upon him. And as Christ shed his blood upon that cross, Not a drop was shed in vain. Upon that cross, as Jesus died, there was a transaction between the Father and the Son. And we heard about this in the last lecture, that there was no payment given to Satan. The transaction was between the Son and the Father in fulfillment of the eternal covenant of redemption. And as the the Son laid down His life upon the cross, He was not short-changed, and He was not overcharged, but He received exactly what He bought and what he paid for. There was a precise transaction that occurred. He did not die for the entire world, but only received the elect. Instead, upon that cross, Jesus received exactly through the merit of his redemption, all that he purchased and only what he purchased upon the cross. And so that is what good preaching looks like. Steve Lawson is bringing the thunder in that sermon. You guys, that's how people should preach. You say, well, I don't want to believe it. I want free will. World cosmos means all people. He died for all people. He died for people in hell. You believe chance is a possibility? There are so many problems. You see, the problem with this theology is you. It's the person bringing the charges against God. And they say, oh, I could never love a God like that. Well, maybe you don't love God because there are some serious implications to your theology that makes you the reason you're saved. If you're consistent, this is not a universal atonement. And as Christians, born again Christians that hold to the doctrines of grace and understand this and celebrate this, This is a reason to boast in the cross. This is why we do this. We boast in the cross. You say, well, I'm not going to believe this. Arminians aren't going to be persuaded. If God grants repentance and faith to those that are unconverted, and if they are converted, they'll recognize the voice of God in the teaching of God. And so there are a couple points that we have to go through here. Number one, your will is not supreme. God's will is supreme. You make real choices, but you are dead in trespasses and sins. So R.C. Sproul, in his book, the book uh, Chosen by God, the neutral view of free will is impossible. It involves choice without desire, okay? That's the problem. Where did the desire for sin come from? You say, well, it was free will. God says you can't love him without free will. Well, I reject everything Frank Turek says and the people that push this. It's not intellectual. It's Norman Geisler 2.0, and it's not deep. It's not well thought through. It's not based in church history or in biblical exegesis. There's not a consistent hermeneutic that yields this poisonous fruit of self-righteousness. It is impossible to have a neutral will. Desire drives the actions. That's like having an effect without a cause. This is the same thing we mock the idea of atheism for because you have nothing becoming everything. You can't get something from nothing, which is irrational. The Bible makes it clear we choose based out of our desires. A wicked desire produces wicked choices and wicked actions. The choice of uh, the, the kind of the problem of where evil came from God decreed it. We've already covered this, and people have talked about this for years. God decreed it, but is sinless in the way that he did it. Uh, Humanity is responsible for our actions. 
you don't get to decide how to understand that. That is what God teaches, and you are not the authority over God. The great superstition of modern times is focused on the role given to chance in human affairs. Chance is the new reigning deity of modern mind. Chance inhibits the castle of the gods. Chance is given credit for the creation of the universe and the emergence of the human race from slime. Chance is a shibboleth. I don't actually know what that word is, shibboleth. I meant to look it up. It's a magic word, basically. And you saw that in free the Free Willy clip. They're like chanting. I think it was um, maybe Navajo or some sort of Native American language. We use to explain the unknown. It's the favorite power of causality for those who will attribute the power of anything or anyone but God to anyone or anything but God. And this is a huge problem. And let me explain why. This basically gives humanity the same power that Jesus had in raising from the dead. This means that dead people can come to life. Now, there are many verses that say Jesus died for many. Through one man, many will be accounted as righteous. It doesn't say all in Isaiah 53, I believe it is. It's also in the New Testament over and over. He died for many. He did not die for all because if he died for all, all would be saved. They're not saved because he chooses not to save them. It's his grace to give. He did not die and pay the sin debt for people in hell. I ask Arminians this. So you believe? Natural theology, which is Roman Catholic, that people are graded on a curve based on how much information they had available. And, well, maybe God will count that as righteousness if they didn't hear about Jesus. That's a Roman Catholic view to get around, basically, the grace of God electing to save whom he will. It doesn't work. It's not biblical. God knows exactly where he's put people. He knows exactly whom he's died for. He knows exactly whom he's saved. And that is what grace is. You still don't like that. Then the problem is probably you. The problem is your self-righteousness. And this is something the church in our day is very soft on. And more and more, I'm becoming convinced it's a problem. It's the uh, basically the humanistic view of the will and the Arminian position, the semi-Pelagian view of, of uh, the atonement and free will basically being accepted. It shouldn't be accepted. It should be rejected. It's borderline heretical, if not fully heretical, if you take it to its logical conclusion. It's not based in scripture. It robs God of his glory. It makes man the reason that the person is saved because I made the good choice and you made the bad choice. I had convenient grace, provenient grace, provisional grace. I had free will, autonomy. I'm autonomous. That's the oldest lie in the book from Satan. You cannot apply a consistent hermeneutic to the Bible with this view of the atonement or this view of the human will. Humanity is dead in sin, dead as a doornail, totally dead. In all these ways, the justification of believers under the Old Testament was exactly the same as justification believers under the New Testament. You can do that as a person that actually holds to what we call the doctrines of grace, or in this case, just biblical grace and the will of man being dead in sin. You can hold to this view and provide a consistent interpretation of the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God is seeking and saving and keeping his people. You're still not convinced. By his obedience and death, Christ fully paid the debt of all those who are justified. He endured in their place the penalty they deserved by his sacrifice of himself, his bloodshed on the cross. He legitimately and really and fully satisfied God's justice on their behalf. Yet their justification is based entirely on free grace. The Arminian can't say this. The Pelagian can't say this. The Flowerite can't say this. The Provisionalist can't say this. Because well, Make it up. Just make it up as you go. Anything new is pretty much going to be false anyways. Yet their justification is based entirely on free grace because he was given by the Father for them. His obedience and satisfaction were accepted in their place. These things were done freely, not because of anything in them. So both the exact justice and the rich grace of God would be glorified in the justification of sinners. You're a sinner. You don't think you're that bad. You think, well, I'm basically pretty good. I do my best. I have free will. And you're like this clip of this movie. You're like this clip of this video where, where they're chanting like, just one time, just do it one time. But the problem is the atonement is limited to the elect. So we don't we can't go there because there is a hell and it's full of people. In fact, most people. So the atonement is limited. Then the question is, who limits it? Do we limit it or does God limit it? And the answer to that question biblically is crystal clear. God limited it. He limited it to the elect. Either God determined whom he would save and take to glory or God just threw atonement out there as some nebulous option and hoped some people would grab hold of it and become a part of his redeeming purpose. The Bible does not allow for that. So you, you just need to remind yourself, you believe in a limited atonement. Now you ask the question, are men sovereign or is God sovereign? If God's sovereign, then he limited it. 
Clearly, God is sovereign. God determined when to create you. And the idea of being born again is to is to specifically remove your self-righteousness. It's all throughout the Old Testament. This is not a New Testament teaching. This is not a John 3 teaching. This is an Ezekiel 36 teaching. And there are many other places in the Bible. Ezekiel 37, dead bones. Can these bones live? You know, only God grants life. Only God can give life. And it's not based on your neutral ability to somehow have this island of righteousness to choose God, even if you've never heard of Jesus? What kind of blasphemy and heresy is this that people are accepting in our day? It's bad teaching. It's bad preaching. It's lack of clarity in doctrine. And it basically puts man at the center of the universe instead of the sun. You see, the sun in the middle there is the reason in terms of the Trinity, the son died for the elect. The father chooses, the son redeems, and the Holy Spirit regenerates. Only in this view of the atonement do you have the Trinity actually working together in perfect harmony. Every other view, you have the son dying for people, but oh, they're just not good enough. And the Holy Spirit, like, come on, maybe. And it's completely, the, the Trinity is completely at odds with one another. And you have this problem of dead people living. You have dead people just choosing to walk out of the grave. Well, they're not really dead. They're just really sick. It said nowhere in the Bible, it says they're dead in trespasses and sins. It says, it says you need new life. You need eternal life. You need life from the Holy Spirit, which you can't cause or create. So regeneration always precedes faith because life precedes death in this example. And it produces faith and repentance. And it happens in a moment. But from our side, Christ died on the cross for actual people. It was a real atonement. It's an actual saving atonement. And this really fires me up because people don't obey the authority of the Bible. And they come up with all sorts of systems. They won't explain what creed or confession they actually hold to. You don't know what you actually believe. And you're trying to bring up charges based on your own detective work and making up things and hiding in the shadows. Don't waste our time with that. If you're not going to be transparent and actually outline your position so that it can be discussed, there's a reason you're doing that. You don't know what you're doing. That's not how anyone should do theology, and it's not worthy of anyone's time to try to answer someone that's not actually interested in hearing what the Bible says. The Bible is crystal clear on this, and this is how God has always saved his people. This is an authority issue. Those that God effectually calls, he freely justifies. He does this not by infusing righteousness. In it. You don't have some sort of infused island of a little sprinkling of grace. The Holy Spirit saves 100% or not at all. He regenerates 100% or not at all. By pardoning their sins and accounting and accepting them as righteous. He does this for Christ's sake, not for your sake, and not for anything produced in or done by you. He does not impute faith itself, your faith, as some sort of righteousness. That's not how it works. He imputes Christ's active obedience to the whole law and passive obedience in his death as their whole and only righteousness by faith. This faith is not self-generated. Your faith is a gift of God. And this has to do with the authority of the Bible. It obligates belief in them. You are obliged, you are commanded to obey the Bible. You are commanded to believe God in this point. There is no gray area. You say, we've been kind of harsh. That's because the Arminian view is steeped in heresy. It's Pelagius 2.0. Everyone that does not study church history, does not study the, the history of this debate that goes back to Genesis 3, did God really say, you will not die, you will be like God. You have the power to choose right and wrong for yourself. You can choose God or not choose God. He doesn't care. He's just thrilled with anyone that decides to go ahead and cash in on that atonement. What a blasphemous view of the atonement. What a blasphemous view of God's grace. What a horrible view of the gospel. What a perversion of grace. I can't, literally can't stand this view. And yet people will line up to hear this preach to him. The Supreme Judge for deciding all religious controversies and for evaluating all decrees and counsels and human teachings is the Bible. It's, it's Christ alone through the word of God alone. It's grace alone. The doctrine of election is clearly taught in the Bible. Grace is based on God's electing sovereign good pleasure. It's his will. It's his desire. It's his work. You contribute nothing to the gospel. Zero. Except the sin, of course, that made it necessary. You contribute to sin. You're dead in sin. God makes you alive. This is an essential doctrine that I think gets ignored. And we, we often say, well, Arminians are Christians. And I say that I think a lot of them are, and I'm not saying that they're not. But honestly, if you believe this, why? How can you hear the voice of God and hate the voice of God? How can you see clear biblical teaching on this and reject it for your economy? You see, what you're doing is you're looking at an English translation and you're 
superimposing, well, A means here, so it always means this here. And this verse says this, so it means that he must have paid for every sin debt. The Bible nowhere teaches that. It's not even in there. John 3, 16, which everybody trots out, is in the backdrop of the impossibility of salvation unless someone is born again, and he's quoting Ezekiel 36. It has nothing to do with who the atonement was for in that passage. It has everything to do with the necessity of being born again. And this is because people are biblically illiterate. They're not studying history. They don't have a creed or confession. They're not studying theology. They're not studying syntax and original languages, or they're unregenerate completely. And we get this mamby-pamby preaching. That's a, I think that's Matt Slick, where people just, they want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to love God that is sovereign to damn people to hell. They, they, they think that God must save everyone. He must at least make it possible. How does the possibility of somebody being saved make you feel better about them being lost? Well, it's their fault. Oh, so if it's their fault, they're lost. Then whose fault is it that they're saved? Well, it's your, you did the good thing. He did the bad thing. And that makes it all about you. And it's pharisaical. And I wonder if people really believe the gospel that holds so tightly to that position that don't see their total inability to, to be saved, that it's all a work of God. Now, naturally, we're all inconsistent in some areas, but the people that will come against this video and, and comment, well, don't waste your time. You don't have a creed or confession. You don't understand church history. You follow Eastern Orthodoxy. That's a cult. It's not biblical. You follow Roman Catholicism. It's workspace. They're both workspace. That's your problem. And you need the spirit of God to submit to the things of God. You, you see, the problem is supernatural. It's spiritual. And this is a reason for us as Christians to celebrate the work of Christ, to actually save us, not based on you at all. And he will keep us, not based on you at all. But we do persevere, and there is a call to resist sin and, of course, to grow in holiness. But ultimately, you're saved not because of yourself, but only because of the grace of God. So if this makes sense, a bit of a fiery video, but I think it's deserved. I think we're way too soft on semi-Pelagians and biblically illiterate people and Arminians and people that might not be converted because we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to offend them. Well, who cares if you're offended? Do you understand the gospel? Do you understand the necessity of God's grace? Do you understand that he alone saves, not based on you at all or anything you've said or ever done, only based on the perfect life, the substitutionary death, and the resurrection of the God-man Jesus Christ, who the Holy Spirit causes to come alive in the heart of the elect? He died for actual people. Don't rob God of his glory. Don't make him incompetent. Don't make you equal with God by being able to make yourself live, have the power of life. What a blasphemous. I just, it's really bad. Let me know what you guys think below. If you're still watching this, if you're still subscribed to this channel after this, take a moment and hammer that like button. Like the 95 Theses. And thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. And go check out that Steve Lawson sermon. God bless.